Welcome everyone and uh, thanks for attending this session about uh, the I3C subsystem. So uh, I'm Mikkel, I work at Bootlin as a, an embedded Linux engineer. Uh, I'm uh, involved in the community uh, primarily as a non maintainer and uh, because I also uh, uh, sent a, a few drivers and more recently I contributed to the I3C subsystem. So, uh, the I3C bus, is it yet another serial bus? And uh, to answer that question, I would like uh, to do this uh, uh, small, uh, to discuss this small situation. So you are a hardware engineer, uh, you want to wear a simple device on a custom board, so what bus would you use? Uh, there are many of them available out there. Of course, you'll have to look at uh, what your targeted device support. Uh, you'll have to think if uh, you have power consumption targets, uh, throughput, wiring, wiring constraints, and maybe as well the number of devices you want to wire. Uh, among all the possible serial buses that could do that, certain are too simple, maybe too slow, too old, uh, or not suitable for, for embedded systems. Generally speaking, I square C and SPY, they work most of the time for this kind of device. Uh, but you think further and uh, you want maybe to wear several devices and you have bandwidth constraints, uh, maybe the devices you want to plug in are a bit complex. Uh, will you still use buses such as uh, SPY or, or I square C? Because I square C is uh, well, pretty slow, uh, it runs at uh, 400 kilohertz, while SPY is fast, uh, it can run at up to 100 megahertz. Uh, the problem with uh, slow exchanges is that uh, they will, of course, last longer. Uh, on one side, it uh, increases the, the power consumption per bit transmitted, and uh, also it means that uh, you'll have extra delays when uh, accessing other devices. Uh, so SPY could work, but uh, SPY needs one physical uh, chip select per device, uh, which is a major issue if you have if you have a lot of devices because uh, uh, wiring constraints uh, are very important when uh, thinking about a hardware design. Uh, I square C on its side uh, suffers from address collision issues because when you buy a device, most of the time it only supports a single or a couple of addresses if you have uh, the, chance, uh, the, the chance of having an extra pin that can be tied up or low, but uh, no more. Uh, if you need asynchronous signaling, uh, as you'll need uh, an additional wire as well. So, uh, yeah, and the, these buses don't have any type of uh, low power modes, uh, nor any or the, no, any device class that could uh, help uh, managing several devices uh, the same way. So here comes I3C. I3C stands for Improved Inter-Integrated Circuit. Uh, so Improved i square c basically. Uh, it's a MIPI aliens specification targeting automotive, consumer electronics, uh, and the, the IoT market. It's a two-wire bus. Uh, with much more feature than uh, just i square c It has a real reasonably high throughput, a lot of uh, internal commands for bus management, uh, the possibility to uh, add to provide devices dynamically to uh, provide addresses dynamically to all the devices. Uh, it has a self kind of self description feature, inbound signaling, hot join, controller handover. Uh, low power modes and so on and so forth. And as a major feature, it is backward compatible with uh, I square C. So why would it be backward compatible? Because this brings a lot of uh, constraints. Well, first, it's uh, in order to ease acceptance of that bus, and uh, of course, improve the reusability of the existing devices. There are plenty of i square c devices out there and uh, it would be a good thing to have them working 
natively on the, the i3 bus because at the beginning you would have uh, you could at least change the controller from an i2c controller to a 3 c controller you would use i2c devices on it that's not a problem and uh, as i3c devices appear uh, you could replace them one after the other until you end up with a pure i3c bus so it has been designed with uh, i2c in mind uh, the voltage levels are of course of course compatible uh, there is a clock uh, SCL and the data line uh, SDA. Uh, uh, it supports open drain output, which is the 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 the, the output mode uh, in I square C, and I will come back to that later because it's uh, very impactant. And at logical level, it also uses seven bit addressing and a set of uh, uh, of uh, comparable signaling on the bus including start, repeated start, stop, ACK and uh, NAC. But, of course, uh, a few tricks are needed in order to have these two types of devices working on the same bus, of course. So, uh, let's deep dive uh, into the I3C protocol. Well, first, we need to talk about uh, the output mode. Uh, this is very important. So, I2C relies on open drain outputs with pull-ups. So this, this is a very uh, cheap design where you basically have a, a pull-up uh, that keeps a weak high logical level. So it keeps the line electrically high, uh, but uh, this is not a strong state. And then it has a, uh, a transistor that then can, when, when uh, activated, when passing, uh, will pull the line low to the ground. And uh, this pulling effect is stronger than the, the pulling effect on the ground is stronger than uh, the pull up uh, with the resistor. So the, uh, the, the implication of that, uh, well, there are two uh, consequences. First, uh, many devices can uh, try to force a particular state on the bus at the same time. And uh, this is not a problem uh, electrically speaking, the just uh, the, 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 con the the consequence of that being that only the uh, the, the the lowest bit vi will be visible. So uh, the device that tries to achieve a one, if another one tries to write a zero on the bus, while well, the bus will be in the state zero in the end. And the other consequence of that is uh, slower rising times. So at 400 kilohertz, that's not an issue. Uh, it, there is plenty of time in order for the line to go up again and uh, stabilize. But uh, at higher frequencies, this won't work anymore because of some capacitance effects. So uh, another output mode has to be used. And this mode that has been chosen in the I3C specification is named push-pull. And it's basically a symmetrical design with uh, uh, at least two transistors uh, to force a strong state both on the uh, low end and the high end. And uh, when in push-pull mode, a bus can run significantly faster. So the I3C bus, uh, the, the, its typical frequency uh, is 12.5 megahertz. Uh, this is uh, the the SDR same simple data rate mode uh, that will use uh, the bus at 12.5 megahertz and uh, and sample one data per uh, per revolution of the clock. Uh, so this is the default mode that all I3C devices uh, should support, and then they are there are faster uh, faster modes. Uh, the, the, the frequency itself won't change, but the way we sample data will change and we can achieve a much higher uh, bandwidth with the same base frequency. So typically using uh, double data rate, DDR, uh, so the clock is still used, but instead of sampling data uh, once, uh, well, we will sample data on both edges of the clock. And there is also the possibility to use ternary symbol pure TSP 
so pure means uh, pure burst when there are only I3C devices on it. And in that case, both signals will be considered data and uh, will track edges rather than levels. And uh, knowing that each transition can be a specific uh, state. So there are, it's, it becomes a three state uh, bus with either the clock transitioned, the data line transitioned, or both transitioned. So you can basically um, carry 50% more symbols uh, while using the same frequency as before. When the controller decides to enter an HD, uh, HDR mode, it must advertise all the, all the devices on the bus. If a device does not support the, the chosen uh, HDR mode, then it just waits for the controller to exit that mode. There is an HDR exit pattern that doesn't uh, require to, uh, to be able to, to understand an HDR message. Uh, so it's just four SDA fall transitions with the clock kept low and then a stop pattern. And this is very easy to implement in hardware because it just uh, requires four latches in series. So any uh, any I3C device should at least have this uh, fallback mechanism in order to know when the HDR uh, communication ends. When there are I square C devices involved in the bus, um, well, first the I square C devices that can be plugged on an I three C bus are only the subset of devices that do not use clock stretching, because the clock in the I three C bus is configured in push pull mode and not in open drain mode like in the I square C specification. Uh, I square C devices should be allowed to stretch the clock. For instance, they are not ready to talk and they can keep the clock state low. Uh, that's allowed uh, with the, the I square C in an I square C bus, uh, but with I three C this is not possible anymore. And other than that, I square C devices should not be confused by the I frequency exchanges. So the solution here is to use. Um, to leverage uh, the, the anti-glitch spike filter that is already existing on the most i 2 devices or add one if, uh, if there is none. So this spike filter will filter out any high level that is over, uh, that lasts longer than 15 nanoseconds. But the bus frequency in I3C is 12.5 MHz, which is an 18 nanosecond clock period and hence a 40 nanoseconds high, um, high period. So a, uh, such a frequency should be filtered out naturally by these filters. And it's also possible to even improve that, uh, that filtering by uh, using an asymmetrical clock so in that case, we'll use a uh, uh, lower than 50% duty cycle in order to keep the low state longer and the high state uh, much shorter than, uh, than 40 nanoseconds. And uh, with a ratio of uh, 2 against 1, we can have uh, high levels of uh, less than 30, 25 nanoseconds. So when there are uh, I2C devices and I3C devices, we call this a mixed fast bus. And such a bus supports uh, basically three clock modes, uh, SDR of course, uh, DDR as well. And uh, instead of uh, calling the ternary symbol um, mode TSP, it's now named TSL for ternary symbol legacy. Uh, so this is a the same logic, but uh, with a slightly different implementation to match the fact that, that there are i square c devices uh, on the bus. If a, an i square c device has no spike filter, it's then a uh, slow bus, a mixed slow bus or a limited bus, and the exchanges will be limited to, the, uh, to work at the slowest device speed, which is a huge drawback, by the way. 
The bus management is uh, handled with common command codes, CCCs. So uh, this standardizes very, very well uh, the bus management and serves all kinds of purposes. Uh, it's, it supports broadcast and direct addressing. So uh, the CCCs are always sent to everyone. Uh, it uses first the broadcast address because all I2C devices, uh, I, I3C devices are, uh, uh, should listen to the entire command. And uh, that's also because you can uh, then target this, uh, this CCC to one or more targets. So below you have the examples. Um, the last bit of the CCC will indicate if it's a broadcast command or a unicast command. If it's a broadcast command, the payload uh, will come right after, and uh, the master, the con the, um, the the controller will stop. Uh, the will will send a stop bit, and uh, that's the end of the CCC. Otherwise, if it's a unicast. Uh, a unicast CCC, then the controller will send a repeated start, then the address of uh, the target that uh, it wants to reach, the payload for that target, the target should hack this uh, CCC, and uh, either it continues with a second and a third and whatever ta targets it needs to reach, or it ends with a stop condition. Here is a list of uh, of command codes. Uh, so we will see the enter DAA uh, command code uh, right after. This is for entering a specific procedure. Uh, you can see as well the get PID uh, CCC which uh, requests uh, the provisional ID of the device. Well, there are many of them, and um, of course uh, none of them are. Uh, 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 well, not all of them are we are supported yet in the Linux kernel, but uh, we will come to that uh, in uh, in a moment. In order to to work, uh, the I2C bus requires uh, seven bit addresses, much like the I2C bus, by the way. Uh, so. Uh, these uh, these uh, these addresses must be given dynamically, and for that there is a procedure named dynamic address assignment (DAA). The I2C devices they don't know about this procedure, so they are they are statically described, and they already have their own address. Um, so all I3C devices should get part of the DAA procedure in order to get that identifier unless uh, they are in a deep sleep state or they are powered down, which is uh, completely okay. Uh, before uh, explaining that procedure, I need to give you some insights about uh, what they know internally. Well, a device has uh, what we call a provisional ID, which is a 48-bit identifier, which contains a manufacturer ID, a part ID, a instance ID, and a uh, few more information. It, con it, um, it has as well a uh, bus characteristics register and a device characteristics register. Uh, the bus characteristic register informs uh, the, the controller uh, about what it is capable of. Typically, is the device capable of requesting uh, the, the, the mastership of the, of the bus? Uh, does it support uh, SDR? Uh, well, what are its SDR limitations? Because SDR will be supported. Uh, does it support HDR? Uh, if it has offline capabilities and eventually inbound signaling uh, informations. Uh, the device uh, characteristics reg register is more like a definition of the class uh, that this device belongs to. So uh, all these can be advertised during the DAA procedure. So uh, the controller sends uh, a well st uh, provides a start condition, then send a CCC command, which is 
and DAA, enter DAA, then generate a repeated start and uh, send the broadcast address. So I3C targets are supposed to respond to that request and they should all send a hack. They will all send a hack, so uh, the, the, the data line must be in open drain mode at this moment. Right after sending the hack, all the targets will provide their PID and then their DCR. So here some kind of arbitration must happen. And this is uh, a natural ab arbitration due to the fact that the data line is in open drain mode. Because I told you high levels are weak and low levels are strong. So the smallest PID uh, will win the arbitration and the highest PID will lose it. How a device knows that it lost arbitration because they are supposed to monitor the bus while sending their PID on the DCR and when the bus is in a different state than what they are actually trying to send it means that somebody else uh, has won the arbitration and they should stop sending. So that's how uh, my uh, target in the middle will stop sending, the I3C target on the right will continue sending and uh, until uh, all the, the controller gets all the information, the controller will respond with a dynamic address and the target should hack that dynamic address. The controller then restarts the procedure by uh, providing a repeated, a repeated start and again the broadcast address. All the I3C targets which don't yet have an address should respond. So there is, on my example, only one left. So this target acts the, the request, then send its PID. This time it will work. The controller will respond with another dynamic address and the target will finally hack that address. The controller will keep repeating the procedure until there is no more device without any dynamic address. In that case, no device will hack uh, the repeated start and uh, that's the NAC condition that the controller will monitor and this is the end of the DAA procedure. From that point, any device can then talk. Either because the controller has reached them with their dynamic address or because they want to provide some asynchronous information. And uh, this is the purpose of the IBIs. These are inbound interrupts. So uh, a device can raise uh, an interrupt in two conditions. Either the controller is initiating a start condition. This is the same start condition as in I2C. So SDA low, then SCL low. And then uh, the device sends its uh, dynamic address. Or the bus is idle for too long. So the device itself will assert SDA low. And uh, the controller is supposed to assert SCL low as well to end uh, that start condition. As the start condition is now, uh, is now done, the device sends its address. At the end of, the, of, uh, of this address, uh, there is a read not write bit. Uh, it must set it to 1. 1 means, so it provides its address on this bit to 1. That means I have an ABI for you. So uh, here again, arbitration can happen if there are several devices trying to speak at the same time. So when the device, when the controller provides the dynamic addresses, it's very crucial to know which address is given to whom because the lowest address gets the highest priority. The controller will hack or knock the interrupt, and depending on the con on the device on the target, uh, the controller might need to read a mandatory byte. So this is something specific to the I3C subsystem. You can carry a byte uh, with uh, uh, with your uh, with your uh, your IBI, and then the controller uh, decides either to emit a repeated start in order to do 
what it intended to do in the first place or emits a stop. The hot join procedure is a very similar to the IBI one. The difference being at that point when a device joins uh, the uh, the bus that has already been initialized, it lacks it lacks a uh, dynamic address. So it cannot advertise its own dynamic address. The condition on which it will speak will be exactly the same as for the IBI, either the controller starts or the bus is idle and the target pulls SDA low. And when it is uh, allowed to talk on the bus, it will provide a uh, reserved address with the read not write bit set to zero this time. And this means I am requesting a new DAA round in which it will get a dynamic address. Another feature is the controller handover. So this works uh, very similarly again than a hot join. So this time the, the, the target which requests uh, uh, mastership of the bus uh, will send its own dynamic address and uh, will end the transaction with a read not write bit set to zero. This means I want to take ownership of the bus. If the current controller does not feel ready, it may knock the request, and otherwise, if it agrees, it must hack it, take some uh, precautions, such as disabling interrupts, um, uh, enforcing the end of some processing happening, uh, disable specific requests, while well, it prepares the bus for the handover. It then asserts a particular CCC, which uh, will proceed uh, the handoff and end this transaction with a stop bit. As soon as the stop bit is sent, the arbit arbitration for that controller is lost. So the controller should release the lines and uh, verify that the new controller asserts its controllership. Uh, now let me tol uh, tell you about uh, a few features that have been uh, added in the v1.1 specification. So uh, this is something uh, that was added in the second time uh, that is also not uh, supported uh, uh, in Linux, uh, but they bring a lot of interesting features such as time synchronization. So instead of uh, having, uh, let's assume a device is a, uh, a uh, sensor. Instead of uh, having the samples on demand only, uh, you could provide, you could request a, uh, an I3C target to send you these uh, samples on a regular basis. So with set X time, you could request a particular frequency and the target would be supposed to generate an ABI each time it triggers a sample. So this is interesting because uh, you'll have the, the you'll get the samples at a more precise uh, uh, rate and also it's a way of synchronizing different devices on the bus. So if you wire them, well s you, you wire several sensors uh, with the same low power clock, you could get uh, samples that have been triggered at the exact same time, which is much better than having to ask uh, to to ask one device to, uh, to to trigger a sample and then another device to trigger a sample and then a third device, and in the end you you get three or more samples with different timestamps. While here, uh, with that feature, you could have all the samples with the same timestamp. Another feature that is interesting is uh, the reset feature. So, uh, as always in the I3C, um, in the I3C specification, the goal is to do inbound as much as possible. So here we want to avoid the need for an extra wire in order to do these resets. So we can use these resets to do two things, either we want uh, 
a global reset of the bus. So this might be, for instance, the master, the, the main controller that actually uh, figures out that the bus is stuck. Uh, as the bus is currently stuck, the, the I3C controller will send a specific pattern that means please reset your uh, I3C controller. So this will only reset the bus controllers and not the, the chip themselves. Or otherwise, it could also be used as a uh, targeted reset, um, assuming that the, the 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 controller will properly um, uh, will properly uh, configure all the targets on the bus to so that only one of the targets will do the reset when it is requesting to do so. And the reset can either be a, a full reset of the chip or only a reset of the bus controller. In order to do that, there is a specific CCC named RST Act, so Reset Action. Um, this means, please do the following when you receive a reset, a reset pattern. And um, this configuration uh, keeps being keeps being the default until a new uh, Reset Act CCC is sent. So a device may either discard the reset pattern, reset the bus controller or reset the entire chip. The reset pattern itself is made of 14 data line transitions with the clock kept low. So it's uh, similar than the HDR exit pattern, by the way. And after that, a repeated start or a stop. Uh, they introduced as well a new uh, mode named HDRBT for bulk transport. Uh, this is useful uh, when you wa you have to transfer a lot of data. So a typical use would be uh, the direct mapping of uh, a SRAM device, for instance. Uh, so it has a lower overhead. Um, it has also enhanced CRC checks so that the sender knows very uh, an, yeah and an additional feature uh, that allows the sender to know very rapidly if the receiver has uh, received the right data or not and if not instead instead of uh, of discarding the buffer it has the opportunity of resending the buffer very quickly and uh, there is an additional feature as well that is interesting um, the clock could be driven by the target in that mode uh, to avoid some kind of uh, round trip time issues as well. Finally, um, after so much effort to keep uh, inbound uh, all the features uh, as much as possible, uh, they decided to add more wires in order to improve uh, the overall throughput. So they introduced multi-lane support uh, with either two or four data lines. And it's now time to talk about the Linux API. So this is a, a picture of uh, the I3C framework. The I3C framework is a dedicated framework. It was a, there was some kind of discussion when introducing it back in uh, 2018 and uh, the goal was to try to not break any I2C user. So instead a new framework got introduced, handling I3C drivers, uh, I3C controller drivers. Uh, so the point was uh, that you could have an I3C uh, device on an I2C bus, on an I3C bus and an I2C as I squash it, I get on both bus, uh, buses as well. So if you wire an I square C target on an I3C bus, it will go through the I3C controller driver, the I3C framework, and the I3C framework will then leverage the, the, the features of the I square C framework in order to get the I square C driver working. 
So here are a few design choices. So it was yeah, uh, built as a separated framework. Uh, the subsystem defines, of course, an I3C bus object, a controller structure, as well as a set of uh, APIs that must be provided by controller drivers in the I3C master controller ops structure. It also provides uh, the API to register a controller, a device driver, and uh, a uh, and the ABIs. The binding between devices and drivers is uh, is made with the content of the PID, the provisional ID. So it, this is made with the manufacturer ID and uh, some uh, instance ID as well. The bus itself, so the struct A3C bus, uh, contains the, the following members. Uh, it has, of course, a pointer over the current master because uh, you can have several, uh, several devices taking uh, the control of the bus. So this must be a pointer, of course, as this may change. The I3C bus mode is uh, the the, the, the SDR or HDR mode that uh, is used. There are a few uh, clock limitations regarding the I3C and I2C devices that could be on the bus. And uh, it, it uh, defines as well the head uh, of the list of I3C devices and I2C devices that are on the bus. The controller itself, well, themselves, uh, they must be described with a struct device, a generic struct device, in order to be registered in the, uh, in the device model. Uh, they also have an I3C device descriptor, which is the I3C descri internal description of the device. Uh, possibly, as well, they can instantiate an I2C adapter when it's needed. Uh, of course, the, div the controller drivers must register a set of operations, that's the, the, uh, the controller API. They can be secondary controllers, uh, we have a boolean to know if the initialization is done, and finally the list head structures, uh, as these will be uh, members of the bus list. This is the API for a controller. There are many different kind of uh, callbacks. Uh, mainly, uh, the, uh, you have bus management callbacks at the beginning, uh, I3C devices management callbacks as well, CCC transactions, pr uh, some to do private SDR transfers, uh, some as well to uh, manage I2C devices, and finally, uh, IBIs. So uh, the core, the, the I3C core will first pass the information provided by the device tree. Typically, uh, what are the I2C devices on the bus and possibly as well what could be uh, the I3C devices. They are not, uh, they should not be described by default, but they can be uh, if they need, uh, uh, if they have uh, device tree properties to advertise or eventually static uh, addresses as well. So the core is aware of uh, the static devices that are on the bus, if any. Uh, the, it then calls the bus init callback to initialize the controller. So that's, that is really the, 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 the hardware initialization and uh, the bus base setup, and then calls do DAA. This is the callback that will start uh, the uh, dynamic uh, address assignment procedure. Uh, the way uh, the controllers will do this procedure is uh, really, really open. The, the core lets a lot, uh, gives a lot of freedom to, 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 to the drivers. And for each device uh, discovered, the controller should call i3c master add i3c dev locked. So this will notify the core about a new device. 
After that, the core will register all the discovered devices to the device model. Now, uh, the device interface. Of course, uh, it, is al it has also uh, a struct device in it. An I3C dev descriptor that describes the device internally and a pointer over the I3C bus in which uh, it has been discovered. Writing a, an I3C device driver is very simple and looks like any other driver in the kernel. Uh, you have to provide an I3C driver structure that contains basically a probe and a remove uh, as well as an ID table. Uh, the registration is done with module I3C driver. Um, uh, the probe and remove callbacks will receive an I3C device pointer. And uh, the binding is done with an I3C device ID table uh, containing, the, containing a list of uh, manufacturer IDs and part IDs. Uh, built with the i3c device macro. From these drivers, doing SDR transfers is uh, also simple and uh, looks like the i i squares implementation. Uh, the the function is i3c device do private transfers, and the private transfers must just be uh, declared uh, uh, like uh, like on the slide. The CCCs for now uh, are not available uh, to be used from device drivers, but this uh, may change in the future. Uh, finally, device drivers may also leverage the power of uh, IVIs. So, um, in the probe, um, one must call I3C device request IBI in order to allocate a set of uh, slots for this IBI. So the way IBIs are handled is a bit specific. It's They are not handled like any IRQ because of these uh, extra bytes and so on. So instead the logic is the IBI slots must be allocated in advance. So you decide how much slots you need and uh, the payload for each of them. Uh, so this is the purpose of the device request uh, call and uh, after that when an IBI uh, uh, triggers the, the, the controller driver will uh, provide the content of the IBI, the IBI and the core will put everything in a queue. So that's why the handler named here IBI handler at the top uh, is a regular uh, a regular helper, it doesn't return an IRQ type for instance uh, and uh, this one will be called in a non-atomic context and the second reason besides the fat fact that there is an additional payload is that in the handler is very common that you need to, um, to to do more transactions with the device and this of course cannot be done in an atomic context. Once the registration has been done the driver is responsible of enabling and uh, disabling the IBIs when needed. Uh, the problem with the, the slots being pre-allocated is a possible overlap if the device driver is not fast enough, fast enough in dequeuing uh, the IBIs. So, what's the status now? Things have moved forward since uh, 2018. Uh, hardware manufacturers uh, look, m look more and more interested. There are now three controller drivers upstream, one device driver uh, upstream as well. well. That was a device, uh, that's an IMU device that supported, I think, uh, SPY and I2C as well. And now it has a 3 c support. Uh, there is an ongoing work uh, to to provide a handover a controller handover support, but of course there is uh, still a lot of room for improvement as uh, HGR support is not yet mainline, as uh, because we, we we lack devices uh, for testing. 
Uh, it would be nice to have a Linux I3C target interface. The features from the 1.1 specification are uh, not uh, implemented yet, so the global and directed resets do not exist, and uh, the time synchronization neither. And uh, finally, maybe we would need as well a slash dev interface in, in order to provide more control to the final users. So this is the end of the talk. Thanks very much for watching. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I should be in the chat. Thanks.